Today we are going to talk about gender identity and equality for transgender people. We are also going to talk about how some politicians have lost their minds <laughs> over which bathrooms transgender people should use. What they don't know or seem to care about, or care to learn, is that gender identity refers to the way you understand yourself and your gender. Transgender people experience a persistent and authentic difference between their assigned sex and their understanding of their own gender. So what's the big deal, you might ask? Shouldn't people have the freedom to be themselves in whatever way is right for them? And shouldn't we respect and support those people for who they know they are? You think so. Yet our society can be very harsh on gender variant people. Transgender children and young people are rejected by their families and kicked out of their homes. They are harassed and bullied at school and in their communities. And transgender adults are discriminated against in employment and in housing and, and, and what's more is that transgender kids and adults are frequent victims of violence. Then there's this matter of where transgendered people can go to the bathroom. Last year, Gavin Grimm, a transgender boy in a Virginia high school, was barred by the school board from using the boys' restroom, even though he had been using it for weeks without any problems. Really? Doesn't that school board have anything better to do? Gavin sued the school board under Title IX. A few months ago, a district court dismissed Gavin's Title IX claim out of hand without even letting him make his case based on the mistaken belief that Title IX's prohibition on sex discrimination didn't include discrimination against transgendered people. Fortunately, fortunately, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit has reversed the lower court's decision affirming the position of the U.S. Department of Education that Title IX makes it illegal for schools to bar transgendered students from the right restroom. If your school is denying a transgender student access to the right restrooms, it is violating federal law. Earlier, this courageous, inspired board of directors now took action. And while that action was focused on the recent horrific events in North Carolina and Mississippi, who passed laws that discriminate against LGBT people. It went much further than that, because we know that our fight is not over. We know that more work is, is yet to be done, and we know that it is our responsibility as educators across this nation 
and as members of this great union to stand up with our brothers and sisters and partners throughout this country to make this right. We know that prohibiting transgender people from using the right bathroom is not right and we will stand up and we will call it out and we will not stop. <laughs> North Carolina passed its law in an emergency session. We heard Tripp share that with us. Apparently, which bathrooms transgender people use constituted an emergency. Several legislators justified their action by saying, we had to do something to protect our children. We know that this is a bogus issue, conjured up by people who apparently feel threatened by LGBTQ people gaining equality in our society. There is absolutely no record of a transgender person committing a crime in a bathroom uh, that's right for him or her. Not a single incident has been reported anywhere Mississippi's law is even more sweeping than North Carolina's. Its law attacks trans transgendered people, same-sex couples, and unwed parents in every facet of life and at school and at work and in even their family lives. Mississippi educator and NEA director Darian Spann called it a sad day for our state. Darian points out that people once used religion to justify legalized discrimination against black people. Now they're using it to discriminate against another group. According to the Human Rights Campaign, some 115 bills legalizing the discrimination against LGBTQ people were introduced nationwide in 2015. And it's getting worse, not better. Which makes this the perfect time for us to celebrate the transgender movement that is very much a part of our long line of activism as people who work to ensure the rights of all in this country. We must never allow the tea in LGBTQ to be silent. The fight for transgender equality is our fight. It is our fight, NEA, and we are ready to take up that fight. We have with us this morning Nicole DeVore, Chair of SOGI, NEA Sexual Orientation Gender Identity Committee, and Frank Berger, co-chair of NEA GLBT Caucus, who will introduce our very special guest, who, I might add, is very, very special to me, because she hails from Susquehanna Township in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I know. And not just that, but I taught her niece and nephew physical science in the Susquehanna Township Middle School. So Miss Mara is very special to me. Ms. Nicole, please come up and share with our NEA board uh, what wonderful work uh, Mara has done. And of course, Frank, you too. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, as usual, I would like to invite the members of the GLBT caucus to please come and sit on stage. Of course, we have limited seating, so those that are fastest will get a seat. <laughs> uh, if, if you like, if you're a member of the caucus and you know that you're not going to be able to make it up front, if you want to stand and be recognized, we really appreciate our members of the caucus, our allies. <laughs> Um, sure. <laughs> 
See, I told you, you gotta be fast to get a seat. Uh, our very special guest today is Mara Kiesling. She is the founding executive director of the National Center for Gender Equality. As a leading national advocate for transgender equality, Mara has appeared on news outlets including CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and C-SPAN. She has made sure that the T in LGBTQ is not silent. And throughout the current dialogue about which bathroom transgender people can use, Mara has been calm, clear voice of reason and sanity when reason and sanity was in very short supply. In her media interviews, Mara always manages to bring the focus back to what matters most. Transgender people are human beings who deserve our respect and support. Mara is a transgender identified woman and parent. She grows up, she grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. She attended the same high school as Becky. And she went to, uh, she went to graduate school in Pennsylvania University, or at Penn State, excuse me. She did her graduate work at Harvard University in American government. And in 2005, she received Harvard University's uh, Outstanding LGBT Person of the Year Award. Mara brought her 25 years of professional experience in social marketing and opinion research to her advocacy for transgender people. Under her leadership, the National Center for Transgender Equality has excelled at coalition building within the LGBT and civil rights communities. The NEA is a proud partner with the Center for Transgender Equality. I want to point you all to the Schools in Transition, a guide for supporting uh, transgender students in K through 12. This is an NEA document. It partnered with uh, many organizations. We have some hard copies, but we have ensured that it is on the 360 so that you can take a digital copy and use it. It's amazing as a resource. Gives a guide to bathrooms, pronoun use, etc. Please look at that. Okay, now back to the script. Let me uh, just add that earlier this week, this week, Mara was in Raleigh, North Carolina, where she used the restroom in the governor's office. She joined protesters uh, at a sit-in at the Capitol and was arrested. There's photo proof on Facebook. <laughs> My friends and colleagues, please give a warm, warm welcome to Mara Kiesling. I am so honored to be here. Um, and just so thankful for um, really everything the NEA does, uh, everything educators do. Um, from, from the Schools in Tran Transition Guide, which we have on our website as well. We, we think it's just an amazing document. To the, to the NBI you did this morning on helping to fight the backlash against LGBT people. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful and honored uh, and I'm just personally just very honored to be here. I, um, I you know, suddenly we found, I, I, last year I started telling my staff, all we're gonna do next year is bathrooms, schools, and bathrooms in schools. <laughs> and they all thought I was exaggerating. And we've, we've tried to gear up, we're a smallish organization, we now have 14 staff, uh, but we've been, We've been all over the place. I've been in Pierce, South Dakota. Uh, I've worked in Washington State this year, South Carolina. Um, I will be in Alabama quite a bit in the next couple weeks. Um, and honestly, I'm feeling like I might have wasted my arrest in uh, Raleigh, what was happening in uh, Oxford, Alabama right now. 
but apparently I have an unlimited supply of arrests, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but, but I want to bring this back a little bit, and, and uh, what I have to keep reminding myself and everybody else is that we're not talking about an issue here. Like, how did this become an issue? Well, this isn't an issue. Um, I mean that in certain in several ways. One, you know, there have been trans people using the bathroom everywhere forever. I've been using the women's room for 20 years. I have never had anything that anybody would call an incident. Nobody has ever called me out. I think a couple people have been like, oh my God, she's tall. Um, <laughs> um, and a couple people may have, you know, been, you know, huh, I wonder, uh, but, but everybody has always acted the way they should. They do their business, they mind their own business, and then they go about their business. This, has, this, this, this just simply hasn't been an issue until people try to make it an issue. But, but another way in which it's not an issue, I see every time I go to one of these state capitals to try to fight these bills, because what always happens is kids come. I'm talking about first graders and 12th graders and sixth graders and everybody in between. Sometimes they come with their parents, sometimes they don't come with their parents. I was on a, a four and a half hour bus ride from Sioux Falls to Pierce, South Dakota with four high school students who, who had to go on this day long lobby day trip to, to try to tell the legislature and the governor what it was really like. And, and I worked with a, a high school student who went and met with the governor and told him what it was like. Um, yesterday on public radio in St. Louis, any St. Louis people here? There was this wonderful second grader who I adore named Maisie. Maisie was interviewed on NPR. This is about Maisie, this isn't about an issue. This is about this beautiful second grader. This is about Sky Thompson in Greenville, South, uh, in Greenville North Carolina who went and spoke to the state senate committee that was quickly passing this bill in North Carolina one month ago. And, and Sky would just so poignantly said, every day I go to school and I don't know if I'm gonna be bullied by kids. I don't even know if I'm gonna be bullied by teachers or people who work at the school. And now you're telling me my state senator is bullying me, my governor is bullying me. Um, I need you to stop this. And he said it with clear voice clear eyes, and they heard him, and they all were like, oh, and they looked away, and they didn't know what to do. Sky then wrote to the governor and said, meet with me. Um, that right after past the Senate, Sky and I had, and his mom had gone to the governor's uh, office and met with his senior staff and said, let Sky meet with the governor before the governor decides what to do. And they were like, oh, yeah, we'll talk about that. And he signed the bill like seven minutes later. Um, and Sky wrote a public letter saying, governor, meet with me. And I still think that's going to happen. But this is about Sky. This is about you know, a ninth grader. This is about Dylan in Arlington, Virginia, who I had lunch with last Saturday. He's the, the child of a high school friend of mine who was looking up transgender stuff on the internet. When they found out they had a transgender teenager, they were like, we better find out about this. And they saw my name and called me up and I had lunch with them. And this is about everything that child is facing. This is about about people like me who are older, but I can take care of myself in public, I can take care of myself in the bathroom, even in places like uh, Oxford, Alabama, which just several nights ago passed a law basically outlawing transgender people. And I wanna tell you what I mean by that, because they would, they would uh, not like that representation, but what they said was transgender people have to use the bathroom according to their birth certificate. Now I think most people in America probably say, well, yeah, that probably makes sense. That's how it's always been, right? Like the men in the men's room and the women in the women's room. And in fact, that's how it's always been, except it's not really that easy, right? Because we all know nothing's really all that easy. <laughs> but the truth is, I'll just use me as an example. I simply cannot use the men's room. This is not, I go out in the hallway and I'm like, which shall I use today? Hmm, I wonder where will I feel most comfortable? It is simply that I cannot. Um, Maisie, this little second grader who transitioned, I think, when she was in preschool, she simply cannot use the boys' room. This isn't about her comfort. This is about, this is about I call it the ruckus rule of bathroom use. You know, the way it's always worked in our society is everybody uses the bathroom that creates the least amount of ruckus, right? For some people who are maybe gender nonconforming, 
they make a ruckus no matter which bathroom they go in. And that's something we have to work on. That's why gender neutral bathrooms are very, very helpful. And more and more schools are creating private dressing rooms and private shower rooms and private bathrooms because everybody likes their privacy and I think we all get that. But, but until, which I don't think will ever happen, we decide that everything in the world is gender neutral, there are no sex segregated spaces, we have to understand that people have to be, there has to be an honor system about this and people have to use the bathroom that will cause the least amount of ruckus. And we have to make the kind of accommodations we make for all sorts of people, for all sorts of other people. We have to include everybody. We have to make schools so that everybody can go to school. Um, so this isn't an issue. This is about real, real kids and it's really important. There was a, a, a case that Becky didn't mention that I just want to talk about really quickly in Palatine, Illinois, uh, right outside of Chicago, where a student in high school uh, who was a student athlete was told she couldn't use the women's room. Um, they gave her separate, uh, separate facilities to change in and to shower in. Um, and again, that's something that sounds very reasonable. Um, and at first, she and her parents said, let's try it out. But what they found was she became an outcast. She became an outcast from the other kids because they knew there was something wrong with her that caused her to be segregated away from all the other students. They knew that it hurt her because all of her teammates would go out onto, I still don't actually know what sport it was, but let's say it was basketball, I just don't know. But she'd go to start the game and she missed the pregame conversation that happened in the locker room. And then after the game, she'd go to her private locker room and she'd shower, she'd, go to, she'd rush to the door of the other locker room and all of her teammates had already gone off to dinner somewhere and she had been excluded. Um, it, those may sound like little things, but you know for a teenager, those are really, really huge things. Um, Sky was telling me, I think it was Sky, it was one of the teenagers I've been spending a lot of time in state capitals with. Oh, no, no, it was Dylan. It was, it was the one here in Arlington. He said, I'm not, they're, they're my school, he's a, he goes to a private school. Actually. He said, they're building a private bathroom, and I am not going to use it. And his mom said, well, it's, it would be your own bathroom. He said, first of all, everybody's gonna wonder what's wrong with me. Second of all, all the other kids are gonna use it to make out in. <laughs> now, that's a real consideration for a teenager, right? Um, but, I, but I think this is a really important thing. This is so much about the kids. When, when I heard Sky talking about being bullied, uh, you know, when I, hear, when I hear a second grader say to me, I don't understand this. Why can't I use the girls' room? When you see Maisie, I, I just don't know what these people think go on in second grade bathrooms. Um, but, but I think there's a real problem. You know, we saw several presidential candidates get involved with this. Uh, Governor Huckabee, when he was running, oh my gosh, like this guy is a minister and a former governor and he's talking about how if he had, had uh, if, if he would have claimed he was transgender so he could be a peeping Tom in the girls' locker room. Um, and, and as weird and creepy as that is, um, Senator Cruz, um, after, he's, he's sort of going backwards. I'm, I'm very nonpartisan, by the way. Um, I love saying that. Uh, our organization <laughs> is very nonpartisan. But, I mean, Senator Cruz, he's losing. He's on the brink of losing. He's just about to lose. He's about done. So he names his vice presidential candidate. Um, when he's finally eliminated in the next couple weeks, I suppose he will immediately go into an inaugural speech. Um, and in, that, in that inaugural speech, I think he's going to talk again about transgender people. Uh, they, they ha the Cruz campaign now has an ad up in, I think, Indiana, uh, attacking Donald Trump, who has come out on our side on the bathroom thing, so that's inexplicable. Um, uh, but, but to be fair, on it, uh, I'm happy he's done that, but it's still kind of inexplicable. But, but Ted Cruz's solution is transgender people should just use the bathroom at home. And well, and again, there are probably some good people in America who are like, well, I, maybe that makes sense. And I, and I believe me, there are a lot of transgender people who wish they could do that, who really do wish they could do it. I'm an extremely confident person. I am the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, and even when I'm an extremely 
friendly space like the NEA, anytime I use a public bathroom, I wonder, is this the time someone's going to is bother me or harass me or call the police on me? Because people really do harass. Uh, I have a friend who was thrown to the ground and sat on until the police came. This stuff really, really happens, and it happens to kids in schools. And right now, there are sheriffs all over the country. There are lawyers and people who are, just should know better who are talking about committing violence against trans people in bathrooms. This conversation that people, no, no, mostly nobody in America wanted to be talking about transgender people in the bathroom. Transgender people certainly didn't, but I don't think anybody did. But now we're being forced to hear about, we're hearing from adults talking about violence. We're having cities like Oxford, Alabama, say that transgender people can't use bathrooms. Because you know what? If I can't use the women's room, I can't use the bathroom. And if Maisie can't use the girls' room in second grade, she simply cannot go to school. And if, if somebody who works at the NEA can't use the right bathroom, they can't use the other bathroom. They can't have a job. And th this is such an existential threat to trans people. We are not, this is not about which bathroom do we feel safer in, which bathroom do we prefer, do we want to use the bathroom we identify with. It is so much more practical and existential than that. I simply can't use the men's room. It wouldn't be good for anybody. And we have to watch that. I um, wanted to talk a little bit about what educators could do to help trans people. And the answer is so obvious, it's be an educator. Be an educator about everything, but be an educator about diversity, be an educator about fairness. Um, but then look at the Schools in Transition Guide and, and think about what you do. Think about how you react to kids who have gender differences, whether they're transgender or just maybe non-conforming, or maybe when you say boys over there and girls over there, the kid who twitches a little because neither of them fit quite right and their whole life they've been slammed into this box or that box and they still don't know what to do. But think about what you can do to that. And then the other thing you can do, you've already started to gear up how you can help us as a community and us as a movement, whether that's the LGBT community or the trans community, but also gear up to hold us accountable. We, there's so many of us in the movement now and a growing number of us who are trying to get a point across and I will tell you what that point is. And please, poke at us about this point. Yell at us about this point. If you have to beg or slap us or slug us in a good family friendly way. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a pacifist, I probably shouldn't use violence metaphors. But, but let me say what many of us are trying to get across to our community and our movement. We believe we have an obligation to fight. But we believe we have an obligation to win. We have to have a moral movement, and we have to have an effective movement. And I do not believe we can any longer have either an effective movement or a moral movement unless the LGBT movement, unless the transgender movement is a pro-woman movement, an anti-poverty movement, an anti-racism movement, a pro-immigrant movement, and very importantly, a pro-worker movement. Our movement has to be those things. We need to show up for you. You need to show up for us. Because the trick here is, you are us, and we are you. And an insult to anybody, an injury to anybody, is an injury to all of us. So when I go to the state capitol in Raleigh, or when I'm going to the city council meeting in Oxford, Alabama in the very, very immediate future. And I, whatever bathroom I use, there's a lot to be afraid of. Um, there's a lot in our society and our politics to be afraid of right now. But the amazing poet Audre Lorde, who identified as a lesbian mother warrior poet, uh, a, I'm sorry, a black lesbian mother warrior poet, the amazing Audre Lorde um, said something that is the only thing on my wall in my office. It's a plaque I have. And she said something that I think fits into all of our work, whether it's our work as educators or our work as civil rights people or whatever our work is. And, and Audre Lorde said, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. So important to hear. When I 
when I use my strength in the service of my vision, it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. There may be a lot to be afraid of. There may be all sorts of things happening. But when I go down to Raleigh, North Carolina, and the Moral Mondays campaign is happening by the North Carolina NAACP, and they say, we want to support you. Will you support me? We want to be your friend. Will you be our friend? We think your issue is our issue. Will, will you make the, our issue your issue? I know that HB2 in North Carolina is about trans people in the bathroom, but it's also about not allowing a minimum wage hike. It's all, also about not letting communities have working wage laws. It's about stripping all people of their state uh, civil rights laws based on religion, race, nationality, and sex. Those are our issues. I am the North Carolina NAACP, and they are the National Center for Transgender Equality. So when I got arrested on Monday, I was so proud that it was not a transgender uh, event. It was not an LGBT event. It was an NAACP event. And if, I mean, oh my gosh, if you can be arrested doing direct action for the NAACP, what bigger honor is there than that? <laughs> So think about trans children. They are so amazing, and there are so many of them. When I graduated from Susquehanna Township High School, I have, I'm about to say something. I have no idea if this is the truth. I really don't. But in 1977, when I graduated from Susquehanna Township High School, I do not believe there was an out transgender child in public school in the United States. No idea if I'm right. I think I'm right. Now there are transgender kids in almost every school. Who has a transgender child in your school? At least one. Holy transgender child. <laughs> I think that's amazing. Look for these kids, protect these kids, nurture these kids, understand the amazing possibilities they have because they're the kid, they're the extraordinary, amazing kid who did what most people don't have to do. Look at themselves and say, here's who I really am. Here's what I understand. I'm going to go about doing it, even though my parents are saying, what? And the school's saying, what? And everybody is saying that. And I might get hurt. I might get killed. I might lose my job. I might be thrown out of school. But this is me. This is me. Look for those kids. Nurture those kids, please. Support those kids. And, and just kick ass. And when you <laughs> dare to be powerful and use your strength in the service of your vision, it just isn't at all important whether you're afraid. You will kick ass and you will be amazing. Thank you guys so much.